Welcome everyone to part one of my two part uh, one year anniversary contest. Um, so this is part one, the Q&A. Next week I will be doing the drawing for the prizes. Or, you know, there will be one win winner for the trade and the comics. And uh, anyways, um, to recap, uh, I asked everyone to send me one question, uh, anything you wanted to ask me, and in this video I will be answering those questions. But at the same time, I wanted you know to know your own answers to, to those very questions, so that way you get to know me and I get to know a little bit more about you. So I have only... Well, five entries for for the contest. Um, hopefully, in an upcoming um, upcoming contest, I'll I'll get more entries, and uh, well, I'll see uh, if it will be an a subscriber contest or if I'll just do a second anniversary one that way and that what whichever comes first and if I have anything to give uh, so you know let's get down to the uh, questions uh, so first off Davidus Raccoonus uh, uh, asked me do you follow any sports or sports team? Um, the answer to that is yes, I follow baseball. Uh, I really liked baseball since, you know, I was a kid. Uh, I think it's, you know, family tradition actually. Uh, baseball, um, you know, uh, one of my uncles um, loves baseball. My cousins, you know, my uncle's kids, you know, my cousins. Uh, played baseball when they were kids and uh, so there's always been a constant presence of baseball in my life uh, the first few things I collected before comic books were um, baseball cards somehow those got my attention when I was very young uh, and I was living actually at that time I was about maybe nine years old um, maybe ten no, around nine nine years old. You know, in the supermarket. You know, I was living in in the states at that time. Uh, I lived in the states from 1987 to 1990. So one day, you know, my mom, I, I accompanied my mom to the supermarket, and I saw this plastic case with about a hundred baseball cards. And I asked my mom to get them for me, and she did. And I sort of collecting baseball cards you know and you know nowadays you know I actually catch a game or two whenever I, I have time uh, if there's anything good um, so yeah baseball even younger I actually you know followed basketball quite a bit uh, again living in Florida in Miami my dad used to take us to watch the, the Miami Heat from time to time um, so I kind of followed that. Then you know, in my teen years, it was you know the Chicago Bulls, you know that uh, championship team from the '90s with Michael Jordan. Uh, but you know, baseball is the one I, I'm pretty much caught on. I, I really don't know much about what's going on in in basketball. I know which teams are good, which teams aren't good. You know, but you know, baseball. Um, yeah, the, that I'm always, you know, watching on TV. And I do follow uh, two baseball teams, uh, both of them rivals, uh, the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. I love both teams. Um, you know, I remember watching uh, their most uh, recent, uh, supposedly the, the, the world's... Um, Series where um, the World Series where they supposedly 
broke the um, curse you know um, so we, I mean what I've been following the Yankees and Boston and you know and I'm more of a Yankee fan than a Boston fan you know uh, and you know whenever they played uh, against each other uh, I don't mind who wins but I usually root more for the Yankees than for uh, the Red Sox Ardardy95 uh, he asked me if I, if I have a girlfriend uh, no I don't uh, so you know I'm available but you know seriously uh, I don't have a girlfriend I never really had a girlfriend I've had my crushes uh, you know I had one major crush back in fifth grade you know for three years I really you know I, I really like this girl uh, never really you know, I mean fifth grade and I didn't tell her how I felt until you know the end of seventh grade but at that time which you know, I was actually um, living in Venezuela at the time uh, we were going back to Mexico so living six years abroad uh, so you know I told her but you know I had a few other crushes you know growing up but the fact that I live uh, six years abroad uh, it's not really that great for a kid um, I lived three years in, 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 in for that, like I said, you know, from 1987 to 1990 and in Venezuela from 90 to 93. So I never really had long term friendships with people. Um, so that kind of affected me, you know. I had my crushes, but you know, I had become very shy. So I didn't know how to tell girls that I liked them and. Uh, so yeah, so that's, uh, I'm still pretty shy and I don't really know how to approach talking to a girl through women. And, you know, being shy and not really having uh, friends you know, to hang out with, um, I have no, I have no social life, so I'm kind of in a pretty, uh, I guess, depressing situation. I don't know, but you know, thank you for the question. Uh, Sleepy Reader six 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 asks, "What are the comics you've read and reread most over the course of your lifetime as a comic reader?" Well, I've reread quite a few books. Um, sometimes I do reread -re stuff depending on my mood. So sometimes I really want something modern. Sometimes I want you know something older but I usually find myself uh, reading a lot of uh, I'm rereading a lot of uh, Chris Claremont X-Men uh, I love his X-Men run um, I think it's fascinating you know one of my favorites is you know this the Dark Phoenix saga I I have a quite a few of his uh, 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 issues you know uh, some of the earlier back issues that I bought, you know, once I found out about shops, were Chris Claremont books um, from the 80s, uh, a few of them. Um, not so easy to find now, by the way. So I really like a lot of his stuff. Um, a perfect example, I guess, you know, because once I started reading his stuff, uh, I sort of started analyzing things now. And for me, Claremont is, you know, the ideal long-term writer, but who makes books accessible because of the time you know, that he was, you know, writing the X-Men was, you know, at a time where distribution was kind of spotty. So, you know, uh, you had... Obviously, the distribution was much, much wider. I mean, you stand, you know, drugstores, uh, supermarkets. So, you know, kids could get access to these books. But as he was studying, you know, 
large stories each book had to stand out on, on, on its own and you know Clerman did a great I mean you know he would tell arcs usually two or three issue arcs and you know then you know each issue would lead to to set the stage for each arc you know through subplots and you know for example you know Dark Phoenix the actual Dark Phoenix is you know occurs right around uh, next time 136 no 135 I believe yeah, in X Men One Thirty Five, uh, that's where the the Dark Phoenix story really takes place. The other stuff, the other you know issues that are usually reprinted with the uh, whole story, which starts out with uh, issue One Twenty Nine. They're just, just set up, and in fact, the whole setup for for Dark Phoenix goes you know further back to the um, to previous issues before 129 so you know he sort of set things up and you know I definitely enjoy reading enjoy re reading his work another book I find myself uh, rereading a lot for example uh, that I really enjoy is uh, Green Lantern Silver Age Green Lantern and the showcase uh, books. Um, you know, I've gotten access to most of the Silver Age. I, I, I'm actually missing one volume, two volumes, for to get the whole uh, Silver Age, Early Bronze Age, Green Lantern. Uh, and I enjoy it, enjoy it for various things. Uh, first of all, you know, the art. Gil Kane is the artist. But uh, as you read these books, you sort of start to see how Gil Kane evolved as an artist. So, you know, you can start with, uh, you know, his earlier stuff, and, you know, you get very nice traditional uh, art from the time period, from the early 50s through the you know, 50s, 60s, you know, very clean art style. And then you suddenly you know, his style completely starts to change and evolve into the, uh, you know, into his own um, much more recognizable style from, you know, that you might see in his Marvel work, actually, you know, you know his uh, style completely starts to, to change and, you know, I enjoy Joy, you know, seeing the evolution of of of, of an artist. Uh, I also what I enjoy uh, reading these uh, Silver Age Green Lantern stories is that the writing is really good. Uh, I really like what John Broom does, what uh, Gordon Fox later does when he comes in to sort of uh, alternate with with Broom in the writing. Uh, I I find, uh, you know, that the dialogue is not as stiff as other DC Silver Age books, you know, particularly the Superman stuff and Batman stuff at that time, until, you know, Daniel Luke came and actually John Broom started doing some of their writing. Um, you know, um, so I definitely enjoy that part, but it's also a book that when I was reading this and rereading it, that kind of made me think that DC had something Marvel didn't have at that time. And, you know, Marvel was supposed to start uh, being more of a trailblazer, you know, uh, with Stanley and his uh, writing. First off, you know, the Green Lantern stuff, uh, there is quite an emphasis on Hal Jordan's relationship with, with Carl. You know, you kind of start seeing how that sort of 
starts to evolve. But also, like I said, DC had something Marvel didn't have, and that's the role of women in society. You know, Marvel Stan usually wrote secretaries, nurses, socialites, you know, typical female roles. While, you know, DC, you, you know, you have writers, you know, around the same age as Stan Lee, you know, middle-aged guys writing these books and uh, but DC had female lawyers uh, you know reporters you know Louis Iris West you know they were reporters Jean Learning lawyer and um, then there's Carol Ferris who is a businesswoman and not only that she's the love interest of our uh, hero but she's her boss she is above how oh, as, as uh, in in the uh, professional world you know how is just an employee of, of ferris aircraft and carl ferris pretty much runs the the whole business so that's you know completely different than anything marvel ever had at the time uh diversity uh they also had diversity with with Tom Kalamaku, you know, who at that time was, you know, also had the nickname of um, Pie Face, which is kind of insulting these days. But you know, he was Native American. You know, Stan always gets, you know, he did the first African American supporting character with Robbie Robertson. But you know, Green Lantern actually had a Native American. Uh, before you know Spider-Man even showed up um, so to me I always it always makes me think that DC was a little bit ahead of its time at times you know especially with with, with Green Lantern you have the employee pining for the boss but instead of being a secretary it's a test pilot our hero you know who is in love with with his boss which before that she wasn't but she became the boss so I always thought yeah I mean it does start with some sexist comments that uh, in with in Chuck is number 22 where you know a Carl Ferry says you know I'm pretty disappointed you know that I didn't have a son, but you know, Carol, you know, has a good business head on her shoulders, so I'm making her a temporary buzz while me and my wife go out to uh, uh, to um, travel the world. Then, you know, by 60, 1965, when they brought, you know, Carl Ferris back, uh, Carl Ferris back. Uh, Carl officially did become the uh, the uh, the boss of the head of of first aircraft. Uh, and continuing with Green Lantern themes, you know the uh, Danny O'Neill uh, Neil Adams run of uh, the Green Lantern Green Arrow stuff, and uh, you know the stories are great. The art by Neil Adams is fantastic, and uh, I actually do have a couple of um, of uh, with of uh, favorite panels uh, coming out um, from this run. I'm particularly looking. There we go. Probably this is one of my favorite uh, sequences with Black Canary about to shoot Queen Arrow and how she fights uh, the man control of uh, some guy. Um, but yeah, I really I've reread this a few times and I just love it. You know, uh, um, what what Danny and Neil did, and this pretty much became the standard for. Uh, 
characterization for both Green Lantern and Green Arrow, you know, from this point on. So, yeah, definitely enjoy that. And of course, I love a lot of uh, Golden Age Superman. I mean, this whole, you know, chronicles, like you see right here, 10 volumes of, you know, Golden Age uh, fun. And uh, it's also interesting because as you read each volume, you actually see the evolution of Superman uh, as a character. Um, not only uh, the evolution of, of, of the of, of uh, Superman's look, because obviously some of these er this earlier work, of course, is by uh, Joe Shuster, but uh, there are uh, issues of both action and Superman. We have other artists that were working uh, with with Joe Shuster, you know, in the Joe Shuster studio. Uh, so while it might seem that Joe Schuster sort of, you know, wasn't really too involved with with Superman in later years, uh, he oversaw the whole production of of every issue. Um, he actually, I believe, only did might have done layouts and probably he drew in Lewis's head. Uh, but you know he did oversee the whole thing and he did do a few issues here and uh, the odd cover or issue here and there so yeah so those are probably the books I most uh, I'll probably reread quite a bit um, yeah okay so next question uh, clever presents asks where are you from? I am from Mexico. I was born in Mexico City on May 11th, 1979. And of my 35 years, you know, uh, six years I lived abroad. Um, like I said before. Uh, then, uh, how old are you? I already said, uh, yes, I'm 35. Uh, who do you live with? Who do I live? I live with my whole family. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I live with my mom, mom, my dad, my two brothers, uh, which are younger than me. Not too young. Uh, we're very close in age. Uh, the reason why I still live at home with my family is because since I graduated college, I have gotten very sucky jobs that don't pay enough money um we have uh the custom here in mexico to be paid by the day not by the hour uh and so where my monthly salary has been somewhere in the range of around six to seven hundred dollars a month which is you know which um can allow me for a lot of saving because i have to eat you know i have to buy clothes you know i have uh you know you know things like that um and you know that sort of what has been the standard that the uh, Kids out of college get paid, you know, about six, seven hundred dollars a month, and uh, I've never really lasted too much on on a job. Unfortunately, I've been very unlucky on that. Uh, on my first job after college, I was fired because the company had some financial problems. My second job, I actually worked. Uh, in the city government, Mexico City government, I was making about six hundred or so dollars a, a month, um, enough to to really, you know, yeah, 
I either have to eat or I have to save money and uh, or you know pay rent need you know so I never really paid that much I wasn't making that much money and I actually had to leave that job because in Mexico if there's some sort of change in management in in a government office uh, if you're not union in the union uh, you could re easily get kicked out and be replaced by the new buses people uh, my dad actually got me that job I was working in budgeting I was actually budget control my dad was actually working in acquisitions uh, so you know it was a lot of pressure uh, for for that job because that uh, job position my dad had was uh, one that a lot of people wanted because corruption uh, is one of the easiest places to get to, for for corruption to occur. Of course, my dad is a very honest guy. Um, he really told me, told me some stories about people trying to buy their way into uh, making. Uh, business with with the government which is a lot of money uh, and a pressure for my dad uh, he decided to leave um, and I had to go with him because that guy that was the head of, of the financial department uh, was changing and so I would have to fend for myself for quite a bit and my dad didn't want that um, so I had to leave and you know the job that I'm currently working at is selling insurance and I'm not very good at selling insurance and I'm just making uh, about twenty dollars a month so not enough to live with so I'm stuck with, with my family for hopefully not for too long because I'm actually looking for for another high paying job that in a few months I might be able to start thinking of leaving uh, but you know I'm with my family which is very typical of, of Mexico by the way so that's it uh, JC Seiji asks, besides reading and doing videos on comic books, what other activities have you or do that pertains to comic books? Uh, by the way, I really like the, his, his answer to, to, to the question. Very interesting stuff that JC Seiji does or, or did. Um, as for myself, um, I actually run a blog. I have a blog, uh, which I or originally wanted to be sort of like a magazine, sort of like an online pop magazine, a place where I could uh, showcase my writing. I'm gonna plug. Um, anyway. Um, showcase my writing you know I w at the time I came up with the blog I was at a very creative stage in my life um, when I got into the uh, whole insurance thing that sort of um, brought down all the creativity down so I'm really struggling uh, with the writing stuff um, but you know, so anyway, so I started this blog with my, uh, with this idea of doing sort of like a blog that was very much like a magazine. So we have editorial that would have some sort of interesting article um, and my stories. And maybe an occasional review. But usually it was a place to sort of showcase my stories, you know, get, you know, people to tell me what they thought of those stories, you know, and... Um, you know, because I think my stories are great, but maybe somebody else doesn't think so. And, you know, some criticism always comes in handy. 
but you know the writing thing wasn't really moving things along like I said I wanted to put a lot of different uh, variety of stuff I started to do reviews for the 10th season of Smallville and that sort of got a bit of attention um, and then you know with the new 52 coming I thought well it's a good place to start adding comic book reviews from time to time, from time, to time. <laughs> And so a lot of the number ones I started to review, a lot of more people started to pay attention to, to the blog. Uh, so for a while, you know, I did the whole review thing. And like I said, uh, when I got into selling insurance, between, you know, going to the induction course, uh, obviously I worked at an office so I had to be there like you know every morning uh, sometimes I had to go to meetings to, to pe meet people and you know start selling uh, I sort of neglected the whole blog for a long long time uh, actually with my job at insurance I neglected a ton of stuff by the way um, which I haven't, which has caused me some sort of problems regarding my uh, health insurance, but that's another that's another story. So recently, uh, as you may no have noticed, I sort of started doing the going back to doing just the reviews uh, for the uh, books. I haven't done a few things. I haven't done quite a few of these reviews in recently but you know have to get myself organized uh, it does take time you know just to scan the covers so yeah so right now my blog um, is basically you know coming doing I'm doing comic book reviews of titles that I like um, I might actually kind of drop the ball right now uh, with the whole review thing because I'm finding, you know, like with the videos that, you know, there are that there's very little I could say uh, about certain issues because they're all just coming out so so great that uh, you know I might just go back to doing occasional reviews of books that might stand out a bit stand out a bit. But you know that's what I've been doing. You know, besides you know reading and, and doing the videos, and I do remember I did neglect one question from Clever Presents, which is uh, who's my favorite villain and superhero? As most people know, I'm a huge Superman fan, but that's not the only favorite hero right that I have um, I mentioned the X-Men uh, I really like I mean the last title I dropped from Marvel was the Uncanny X-Men I just love love the X-Men you know I thought I was a big Spider-Man fan not so much you know once things started to go for me anyways downhill um, I dropped Spider-Man, but I just, you know, kept reading both the X-Men and Daredevil. I really like uh, Daredevil quite a bit. Uh, I, I have not picked up uh, the last series or this new Daredevil series. Um, you know, Marvel. It's not, you know, with me in in my graces right now. I'm not that excited about what Marvel is doing. Um, but yeah. Uh, Marvel wise, I love I love I love the X Men and uh, Daredevil. Those were the last books I ever dropped from Marvel because they were, you know, gr great. But you know, I was playing a lot more DC stuff. And yeah, actually, I dropped both of those back in two thousand nine. 
uh, another favorite DC character of mine besides Superman, and this goes back when I was a little kid, is uh, let me see if I have it. It's um. You know, it's um. It's this guy, Aquaman. When I was a little kid, I loved Aquaman. He was like my second favorite character. Um, growing up, I had. Um, I I liked swimming, so I loved Aquaman, and uh, I never thought that character was lame at all. And I think he kind of got lame when you know they were trying to make him a little bit cooler, you know, back in the nineties. Uh, and you know, most most recently, my favorite one of my favorite characters is Green Arrow, and uh, Green Arrow was now character I really cared much for. Uh, you know, I just thought he was a little too old-fashioned. Um, you know, he kind of got stuck in the 70s, I felt. Um, but uh, through Smallville, I kind of started to get interested in, in the character. Obviously, you know, um, I'm picking the Green Arrow book now. But it was this book that... Um, you know, really got me excited about the character, which is, you know, Green Arrow Year One uh, by Andy Diggle, who became, who the character Diggle is named after, and Jock, and uh, it's a really great place to uh, start with Green, with Green Arrow. Um, in fact, this book, Especially issue number three uh, features the first appearance of the character China White. You know, that shows up in the uh, RO TV show. So, it's for first, first appearance is Green Arrow number three. Green Arrow year one number three. So, yeah, so I picked up this book um, a while back, and it's a really good place. Uh, to start with, um, with Green Arrow. I mean, this is Green Arrow post Infinite Crisis, and uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm, and as you know, I really love the Green Arrow book, and you know, the show Arrow is just kicking ass. Uh, so yeah, that's all my favorite superheroes, villains. I did mention. A while back in one of the tag videos that I like, uh, I really like uh, Sinestro. Um, but you know, other villains, um, you know, they're, you know, I like Brainiac and General Zod. I especially like Zod because you know he's just like Superman, power-wise, but you know, completely the opposite of him. And you know Zod can really give a good fight to Superman because he is a soldier, so he does uh, have certain advantages over Superman. You know, he has the power and the training. So you know when, for example, over in Superman Wonder Woman, you know, it made sense that Zod would be kicking, uh, you know, Superman's ass because uh, Superman knows how to use his powers, but he didn't have the sort of combat training that Zod had. So I really like Zod. Brainiac is also a great Superman villain. Um, you know, another um, alien who is prone to be the total opposite of Superman. Um, I gotta say I like a lot of the uh, Superman villains. Um, you know, some you know, like for example, um, one of my favorites because I just thought it was a very ingenious villain is the Shocker, 
I mean, a lot of people make fun of him now, you know, he's never like a, because of his suit and everything. I mean, it's not really cool, it's very sexy and whatnot. But the shocker, I mean, you know, he, he's a, he was a simple safe cracker who came up with this amazing uh, device to create those little waves so he could, you know, break any place and do it without using, you know, some sort of explosive. I mean, you know, he's a very smart guy. And, you know, the costume, though it's silly, you know, it, it works really. I mean, it has a purpose. So, not one of my favorite buttons as well. And, um, I guess Magneto too. I really like when he's a villain. You know, and he's the opposite of the X-Men. I think he works better that way than, you know, as a good guy. But, you know, they're making him more of a good guy now. So, I guess, I guess those are the, um, the ones that I like. I can't think of any more. But yeah, Zod's great, you know, Brennick, I love, as well, you know, great villain, um, you know, Spider-Man villains as well, all of them, all, all that I know, you know, the Lizard, uh, Doc Ock, I think, you know, Doc Ock is, you know, he's a much better arch villain, you know, to Sp Spider-Man than, you know, the Green Goblin. Um, but you know, I just love all those guys. All those Spider-Man villains, they're just fantastic. All the Ditko villains are great, you know. Um, so I guess that's it for the questions. Um, so that's it for part one. Uh, so I guess it's running a little bit late now, but you know. A lot of interesting questions that I've got that I really need to get into. Um, so I'll so like in our like they say in the uh, comics to be continued next week. So for their drawing, so um, that I'm hoping to do this maybe a week from today it could come earlier so keep an eye for the announcement I might probably do something on Twitter announcing the um, when I will be doing the uh, drawing but no yeah. uh, I'm rambling now so to be continued next week so check out wait for part 2 so until next time, uh, keep smiling.